Thank you for joining uh, this discussion on the isolation and ill treatment of political prisoners in Belarus. My name is Jeremy Branston. I'm the Regional Director for Eastern Europe here at RFERL, and I'm pleased to serve as your moderator today. Nearly 1,500 people are considered political prisoners inside Belarus. That includes journalists, human rights defenders, opposition politicians. Belarusian political prisoners are face harsher treatment, and several have died in detention recently, including blogger Mikolai Klimovich and artist Ales Pushkin. The Lukashenko regime systematically exerts psychological pressure on political prisoners by limiting communication with their lawyers and their families, and it is holding an increasing number of prisoners incommunicado. That means that it carries the risk of enforced disappearances, a crime against humanity when practiced in a widespread or systematic manner. Now, we have a distinguished panel joining us today to shed light on this important issue and share their recommendations for policy makers. I'd like to introduce uh, our colleague, Alech Ruzdilovich. He is a journalist for Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, the Belarus service, which is known as Radio Svoboda. He was unjustly imprisoned in Belarus from December 2021 to September 2022. Uh, we also have with us today Anastasia Kruope, who is an assistant researcher at the Europe and Central Asia Division of Human Rights Watch, and Pavel Sapelko. He is a Belarusian human rights defender and lawyer at the Vyasna Human Rights Center. If you have any questions for our panelists, we encourage you to submit them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. So let's begin the discussion. Anastasia, uh, I'd like to start uh, with a question for you. Could you give an overview of the human rights crisis that we're seeing inside Belarus today? How did we get here? And how do you see the issue of political imprisonment within the context of broader human rights trends inside Belarus? Thank you very much, Jeremy. And thank you to Radio Free. Europe for organizing this discussion, which is incredibly important. Um, so unfortunately, the phenomenon of political, politically motivated persecution is not new to Belarus. Uh, we've seen the crackdown of peaceful protesters in 2010. We've seen the crackdown on um, civil society. But um, the scale and the gravity and the systematic and the widespread nature of the human rights abuses that followed that 2020 peaceful protests is unprecedented, at least in the history of modern Belarus. And as you might know, um, in the second report, the examination, the UN Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights and their examination on Belarus came to a conclusion that these grave human rights abuses may amount, at least some of them may amount to crimes against humanity. So this shows the wide scale nature and the gravity um, so, um, once the protests following the presidential elections in 2020 and the contested uh, victory of uh, Alexander Lukashenko that he declared, uh, once the protests lar largely were suppressed, uh, the authorities started targeting the civil society. They started targeting the human rights defenders, independent journalists, and mass. And uh, um, this is not to say that they stopped targeting the uh, protesters or those who are perceived by authorities as those who disagree uh, with the official agenda. But in any case, the authorities were trying to create the atmosphere of fear, the retaliation uh, against the human rights defenders and independent journalists for their work, but also by prosecuting them, they were trying to sort of create this informational vacuum around the human rights abuses that were very much ongoing. So we saw the closed trials. We saw that lawyers had to sign, sign the uh, non-disclosure agreements, meaning they couldn't tell anything pretty much about the cases of their clients. We saw the restriction of correspondence imposed on detainees. We saw the persecution of family members for advocating for their loved ones who were unfairly 
prosecuted. Here, of course, I have in mind Daria Losik, who was advocating for her husband, Ihad Losik, who is now serving um, a lengthy prison sentence on politically motivated grounds. And uh, we also saw that uh, the sources of human rights groups like Yasna and uh, the sources of independent media were labeled as extremists so that uh, the information, that, that the light that they shared on this uh, ongoing persecution, persecution and repressions would be undermined uh, in one way or another. And this is a way to segue to the main topic of our discussion today, the incommunicado detention, because the way the, politic, uh, the political prisoners are treated behind bars in Belarus is also a part of this campaign of silencing them, of bullying their families, their lawyers into silence, because they are subjected to the harsh, uh, harsh conditions in reprisal, in retaliation for people outside of prison speaking out on their behalf and trying to uh, advocate for them. So we see as a practical result of it, as a direct result of this uh, tactics that uh, people don't want to flag uh, their cases as politically motivated. They come out of prison and then report their prosecution as a politically motivated one. Families are also sort of trying to be careful and not to flag their loved one's cases as politically motivated because this could co cause the retaliation. So um, my message for now, before we switch to the discussion, is that um, the repressions are very much ongoing, despite the fact that the Belarusian authorities are trying to silence everyone down. They try to sort of create information of vacuum and hush up the repressions. They are very much ongoing, and it's important to keep that in mind. Thank you for that. Uh, Alech, you recently released a book about the nine months that you spent uh, behind bars inside Belarus. Can you share some of your experiences as a political prisoner? Did you witness or did you personally experience instances of, of isolation, of ill treatment by the prison authorities? Yes, I forgot uh, to to switch the microphone. Sorry, uh, this is my book. It's okay. called "Mayeto uh, Rebne Muri." It means uh, my prison walls. Uh, my experience uh, uh, consists from nine months in the different prisons. Uh, this is uh, four five, four months in the uh, colony number fifteen in near Mohilov and five months before in the different Minsk and Mohilov uh, 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 protected, protected uh, in, investigation, investigation center. Uh, and before I spent uh, 25 days uh, during protests in 2020 uh, in Akrestina, a very famous uh, prison and uh, in Baranovich. And in all these uh, prisons, I uh, saw uh, the things that uh, that uh, show me that uh, uh, government uh, rules of Belarus uh, considered the protesters, uh, members of protests, protest of 2020 as the enemies. Uh, uh, all the conditions in these um, prisons were awful. Um, for example, in Kakrestina, um, you uh, haven't, you haven't uh, opportunity to sleep normally. You haven't um, bags. Uh, you need to sleep on the floor. You haven't uh, puzzles, uh, any communications with uh, your relatives, even with uh, uh, lowest. Uh, you have a uh, very bad. Uh, eat because uh, food because uh, pestles are banished and and so on and so on uh, and and uh, i i have to uh, uh, stress but that is this practice continues even now after three years of uh, protests in belarus because in now uh, and now and now people are arrested and shown and, and um, taken to the Krestina, to the different in other centers, 
uh, in the regions of Belarus, and then began for them the this uh, this line which I uh, had to go uh, through uh, in 2022. Uh, photo uh, slow investigation, uh, a very um, awful court uh, tried, then. Um, uh, very very bad uh, transplantation from uh, from one prison to another to the colony and of course punishment by uh, solitary confinement uh, the is called in Belarus a shiza uh, penalty isolation jail where our uh, condition is very bad now maybe i i uh, I go to Belarusian language, it will be easy for me. So I would like to continue. All of those uh, prosecutions of political prisoners continue literally from the first steps of these persons when they enter Belarusian prisons. From the very first days, people are uh, recorded at, as extremists, which means the authorities pay more uh, attention to them and they punish them more. So they carry the stigma of political extremist, of extremist and uh, uh, and people when in detention can feel it from the very first moment. Previously, that would mean more scrutiny, but today. This means that this person will definitely get into a punishment cell and this is solitary confinement. When on the, I was in, in a colony, correctional colony for the first day, I was warned that I would definitely get into the punishment cell. I tried to follow all the rules and routines. Still, five days after, I was called to the prison manager and he gave me 10 days of punishment cell just because there was uh, some mistake, as they said, in the list of the items that belonged to me and that I had in my cell. And then when I was in a punishment cell, starting from that moment, by the way, uh, I stopped de describing my life in prison. Uh, you, can, you can start reading it. And uh, this is actually on the first page. Is, uh, I recall a person who is standing in front of me uh, in the line of those who uh, have an appointment at the prison manager. And I could hear some cries there inside. And I could see the person who actually wetted his pants after visiting the prison manager. So that is the environment of fear. People are so much afraid of the prison, uh, of the punishment cell that uh, it comes to that. Then I was placed to a punishment cell, but when I was taken there, I was severely beaten on the way to the punishment cell. And uh, they also threatened me with various uh, punishments. They said, uh, we would take you to the, um, to the special treatment cell for actually torturing me. And they um, used uh, uh, actually cold uh, uh, in order to punish me. Uh, you do not have any bed. You you just stay on uh, some wooden floor. Uh, you cannot actually sit during the day. But you, have, you are forced to walk around the cell throughout the whole day. If you sit down on the floor or if you try to lay down, then uh, they will report the violation. And then this will mean that you will get into a punishment cell for another term that's why I got another 10 days at a punishment cell because I was punished uh, for 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 allegedly uh, not cleaning my toilet. They said there, there's a smell, however, there was no smell. I actually uh, had to visit uh, a toilet every hour because uh, my body could not stand uh, this cold day and night, uh, nobody paid attention to that. So I actually was taken to the punishment cell again. So I spent 20 days in a punishment cell. So actually all political prisoners get the same term in a punishment cell. So that's what they get from 
the very beginning. And then when you are in a correctional colony, all political prisoners face very uh, bad ill treatment and scrutiny. And many of those, especially of those who are famous people who are uh, who who are known to the public, they are taken to uh, special cells in prison. And this is a section of a punishment cell. Some of them are taken there for half a year. And after that, uh, you can get into a closed uh, prison, according to Article 1411. And this frequently, regularly happens in Belarus. Also, I would mention a few things about uh, health care. Since there is no good health care in prisons, uh, this is described in my book. Uh, you can open page uh, 223. And uh, I describe a situation when I was taken to a punishment cell. And according to the law, the person uh, should be checked by a health worker whether the person can stand uh, being in a punishment cell. Allegedly, uh, they uh, had to do it, uh, and they had to make uh, some medical tests, uh, they said. And then uh, the officer comes to me, and I'm saying, the doctor said I, I have to take medical tests. And the officer says, it's not relevant anymore. He grabs my hand, and he brings me to the punishment cell. So at the headquarters, they have already decided uh, that I have to be in the punishment cell for punishment. So they didn't care about any health or tests. This happens to everyone. I asked another health worker, how come? And he says uh, really openly, if they want to, they will bring you to the punishment cell. They don't care about your health record. Nobody is going to check your health. So I suspect, I guess, that the same thing happened uh, uh, with uh, uh, Vitold Ashuruk, a political prisoner uh, who was in the Shklov uh, correctional colony. Against uh, his uh, health record, he was taken to a punishment cell where he died. It was back in 2021, two uh, years after that. Uh, this summer, the same situation happened uh, with uh, the famous Belarusian artist Alias Pushkin, he was taken there, he was taken from the Vatsevich Correctional Colony to a prison in Grodna City, and after a long transit, he accidentally died, and I believe that he died under the same circumstances when they simply neglected uh, his uh, medical status, his health status. He was actually processed by this machine, by this harsh machine, and that's why we can see multiple deaths like that in Belarus. And this is relevant not only to political prisoners. I had a bad neighbor. Uh, uh, we, we shared a bed together. He had a tumor in his brain, and he was losing consciousness uh, uh, when we marched uh, in prison. And uh, he, he said he would get uh, to see a, a doctor. Uh, he would go for medical tests just in half a year. He, he was not sure to survive uh, till then. Another person told me, see, in our colony, we have a few people who have died from cancer, tumors. Quite often, people who are in prisons um, develop cancer just because of the stress, and people die there because of uh, lacking health care. Thank you, Alec, for That's sharing right. your very powerful personal story. I think it's important uh, to stress that uh, we're not uh, reading Solzhenitsyn here. We're not talking about the Soviet Union. We are talking about what is going on today in the heart of Europe, in a European country. Uh, Pavel, let me ask you, uh, Vyasna is the leading uh, organization that's keeping track of the ever-growing register of political prisoners inside Belarus. Five of your colleagues uh, remain behind bars there, including the founder of Vyasna and, and the Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Alias Vyatsky. So as a lawyer, can you describe for us the legal and judicial tools that the Lukashenko regime 
is using uh, to perpetuate political imprisonment. I mean, how does the government justify the unlawful practice of incommunicado detention and other forms of ill treatment that we just heard about? Uh, I could tell that uh, Lukashenko regime uses uh, all the shortcomings of the Belarusian law to put pressure on uh, political prisoners and their families. Uh, Belarusian human rights defenders uh, criticized uh, these shortcomings long ago, uh, before 2020, and called to eliminate them and change the law. Uh, I will list uh, the main problems. Uh, weak legislature, uh, weak judiciary, weak bar, I mean legal profession, uh, the prosecutor's office became a supporter of uh, repression and a tool of repression. Uh, lack of an ombudsman, a lack of public oversight in uh, prison, sub subordination of prisons to the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Uh, affairs. Uh, that's why thousands of cases were initiated against Lukashenko's opponents and uh, dissidents. Uh, as you said, uh, 1,500 political prisoners exist in the country and another 1,300 political prisoners were released because they served their sentence uh, or were given non-custodial sentences. Uh, the next problem is what allows for unpunished uh, arbitrariness in the prison. It's the absolute power of the prison authorities over, over the prisoner, uh, as Alex said, the possibility to arbitrarily punish prisoners and worsen their conditions in, of detention. Uh, other reasons are a law that sets limits on the number of visits and allows the authorities to deprive a convict of visits and phone calls to family members. Another law established a rule uh, that only a convicted person can initiate a meeting with the lawyer after the sentence has entered into legal force. That's my short answer to this very complete co complete uh, question. I apologize, a technical issue. I was unable to unmute, but uh, thank you for that. Uh, I'm going to go back to, to you now, uh, Anastasia, to look ahead a little bit. Uh, in your opinion, what can the international community do uh, to end arbitrary and incommunicado detention in Belarus? Are there any international mechanisms uh, that can hold the perpetrators of these crimes accountable? What, if any, leverage do Western governments still have over the Lukashenko regime? Um, thank you, Jeremy. This is a very complicated question, uh, as you can imagine. Um, with regards to coming back to the lack of information, etc., I think it's crucially important that the international community continues to pay attention to the issue of uh, Political, politically motivated persecution, and just be aware of why there could be less information, but the repressions are in fact still ongoing. And as a part of this effort, it's very important to continue to support Belarusian human rights defenders and Belarusian independent uh, journalists who are the ones shedding the light and continue shedding the light on these repressions, who have uh, the understanding of the situation, the connections, uh, that are needed to document the ongoing repressions. And I do not only mean the institutional support, but also uh, continuous support with visas, with residence permits, in a sort of sustainable long-term fashion for people to have the visibility and uh, to be able to continue their work. 
Um, also, there could be some preventative steps if we talk about the arbitrary detention, right? Um, it's not only the continuous uh, humanitarian visas for those people who have to go in exile, into exile, but also trying to come up with the solutions for the arising issues, such as uh, the passports. As you might have heard, since September, Belarusians cannot obtain passports abroad. They have to go back to the country, which exposes them to the risk of arbitrary detention again. So the host countries should try and come up with a solution of alternative uh, identification documents that would prevent people from going back, in many cases when they don't know that they might be facing persecution. Uh, but sort of, as your question implies, I guess it's impossible to stop the practice of incommunicado detention without talking about the overall accountability of the authorities for the great human rights violations they have been committing. And um, I don't talking about the leverage um, and the mechanisms available. Um, I know it might sound frustrating, but the most powerful tool we have is the accountability. And this is not an instant solution. Um, sometimes it takes many, many years for the perpetrators to be brought to justice. But this is why it's, you know, the, the, there is a reason why the authorities are trying to kind of uh, maintain the information, why they try to create the informational vacuum, why they try to anonymize people who are committing human rights abuses. They really are concerned about the accountability, the attribution of this accountability. Um, so right now, it makes sense to focus on um, preserving the evidence of human rights abuses. And as Pavel can tell you, there is a great um, um, great initiative called the Accountability Platform, where human rights organizations, including Belarusian ones, came together to document and preserve the evidence and to attribute the responsibility to the perpetrators. And... Um, in addition to that, we have the examination that I already mentioned, examination on Belarus that is also collecting within their mandate, the evidence of uh, the grave human rights abuses. So we should make sure to um, enhance this mechanism to uh, turn it into the investigative mechanism that can continue their work, boost their mandate so that they do not only focus on the events of 2020, but also can talk about um, the human rights abuses that were committed more recently, right, to be more relevant, to be more efficient, to react to the new challenges that the authorities are proposing. And preserve what we have, which is the UN Special Rapporteur in Belarus and the unique mechanism and tools that they have. And finally, one of the most efficient tools uh, at our disposal is the universal jurisdiction, meaning uh, the ability of uh, the states that are hosting the survivors of uh, human rights abuses to prosecute um, based just merely on the fact that the survivor is now in their jurisdiction. So it is important to allocate resources to these universal jurisdiction cases for the states that are hosting the survivors to look into the cases, open more of them, and to move forward the ones that had already been opened. And um, this is all a long-term goal and a long marathon, but it is a marathon towards justice because the accountability really matters. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, turning back to you, Pavel, uh, are there any domestic legal avenues inside Belarus for, for victims of political imprisonment to find recourse for their families to fight back against the incommunicado detention of their loved ones? Uh, how should we, on the outside, approach uh, advocating for individual prisoners? Uh, is it uh, is it beneficial? Does it harm them? Uh, yes, uh, the authorities have been successful in uh, isolation political prisoners uh, because there are no effective means and tools to resist the pressure. Uh, we are uh, talking about a few well-known people uh, people who have been held in comunicado for months. I mean, uh, Babarika, Kalesnikova, Statkevich, but uh, there are hundreds of cases uh, where this situation continues for a few weeks or a few months, uh, then is interrupted by one letter or phone call 
and then starts again. Uh, the relatives of the prisoners do not spread the word about the problem in order to receive uh, to receive that short call or a few lines in a letter. Uh, we have encountered another problem. Uh, prisoners and are treated with punishment cell ill treatment if their relatives reports report news about them and even for having a lot of uh, information about them in the media uh, there are no legal tool to overcome this situation in Belarus unfortunately uh, it can be changed only by external pressure from democratic countries and democratic yeah. societies. It can be changed uh, if international organization and uh, democratic countries organize criminal prosecution of uh, uh, those who are guilty in crimes against humanity. Uh, and it's crimes against humanity that are happened in Belarus now. So, uh, but our advocacy campaigns uh, coming from the outside on behalf of particular prisoners, uh, something that, uh, that should continue that you recommend or something that you feel harms their, their case? Uh, I think that uh, advocate campaigns uh, has to go on. Okay. Uh, let me turn back to, to Alech now. Uh, two of your uh, RFERL colleagues uh, from the service, two of our colleagues, are currently imprisoned in Belarus. That's Ihar Losik, as was mentioned, and also Andrei Kuznicic. So Ihar Losik has been held in comunicado and has not been allowed contact with his family since February. Uh, what is your message to your colleagues who remained uh, imprisoned uh, in, in, in Belarus, as well as all other political prisoners? Thank you. But I would also add on top that we have the wife of Igor Losik, Daria. She was imprisoned for fighting for her husband to be released uh, from prison. So what message could be sent to these people? You know, it's hard for me to say anything like that because my experience is much less than that. You remember that I spent 20 days uh, in a punishment cell and uh, we have not heard anything about Igor Lasik for, for eight months in a row since February this year. So he must be in a very poor condition and in a very bad environment. I was uh, helped uh, to survive in this uh, environment when I thought, I thought, what if they send me to the punishment cell once again, then I can get crazy. So I was helped by, by the assuredness that then, uh, in the free world, there are people who who did not forget me, who fight for me, that there are people fighting for my freedom. There was an incredible case through the doors uh, in the punishment cell. I could see, uh, hear two people, two officers, uh, two prison officers who could see my name on the door. They said, you see, this is that very journalist from Radio Liberty, and his name is mentioned by many. And then I could see that there was, uh, after, after they found out that uh, my name was mentioned by many journalists, uh, my situation did not get worse. So I believe that the relatives are threatened by the authorities. But they threaten them to sh shut them up. But if prison authorities know that there is some oversight, at least civil society oversight, if there is some echo in the society, then they are more 
careful. So this is my personal experience. Therefore, I would advise that people be careful, but they should not forget that our support is not just a moral support, but this is a real support. And uh, we speak about complaints, visits to prison managers, these uh, letters. For example, my wife wanted to have an appointment with the prison uh, manager, and she got the appointment, and she talked to him. She could not hear anything from me for 20 days because I was in a punishment cell. Maybe this helped. Yes, prison officers had many more reasons to put me in a prison in a punishment cell again, but I was released from the punishment cell in a correctional colony. So probably I was helped by her visit to the prison manager. So if there are people moving in your favor, this helps. And speaking of those people who are in correctional colonies and those who are in punishment cells, what can I advise them? Exercise, do sports, because this helps you survive. So when you have at least one square meter of free space in a cell, you can do physical exercises. For example, I was exercising on a ventilation on ventilation bars. So there are bars uh, on a ventilation uh, a duct, and I was holding it, and I was exercising, and I then I felt better emotionally and physically. And those people who will get there, well, probably you have to get rid of bad habits before you get there. I first of all mean those who smoke, because smoking is not what kills you physically, but this what causes lots of problems in the colony itself. You become dependent on money, on other prisoners uh, who can share cigarettes with you, or they sell them to you, or whatever. Many other things. So you have to be in a good physical condition in order for you to be able to go through many years in prison, to go through punishment cells, and to get to your family health and safe. And another advice. Be more tolerant. Do not worry about some inconveniences in uh, housekeeping matters, in little things. Be more tolerant to your uh, cellmates. There are various people that try to avoid conflicts with them, including conflicts with uh, uh, not only with prison inmates, but with prison officers, and also be responsible to yourself because your fate is in your hands. And the last thing, if a prisoner gets out of the prison knowing that he or she has been loved, cared, and uh, advocated uh, uh, for, then this makes you happy and this will help your life. Thank you very much for your eloquent answer to, to this question and to my previous question, actually. So uh, with that, I think we're going to transition to the Q&A part. I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Denise. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, so our first question is about lawyers and legal representation, and it is it goes as so. How often are political prisoners denied legal representation in Belarus? What is the status of lawyers representing political prisoners? And how can we support lawyers defending political prisoners and defend them against the regime's attacks? I think that sounds like a natural question for Pavel. So over to you. A difficulty hearing you. Uh, if you don't mind, I will continue in Belarusian language. Uh, this is a very relevant question, uh, which really illustrates uh, what's going on in the uh, judicial system, in the legal system of Belarus. And uh, this is what predetermines the fate of all political prisoners and all those who have faced the judicial system in Belarus. 
Indeed, in the last uh, three years, we have lost more than uh, 300 Belarusian defense lawyers. 100 of them are those who were disbarred. Uh, their licenses uh, were uh, recalled. Um, Today, six uh, defense lawyers are behind bars. They are in prisons, so they are prison inmates. Definitely, uh, this affects uh, the status of the legal profession. This definitely affects Uh, the, uh, this affects uh, the way how people are defended in criminal cases and criminal trials, especially if we speak about political cases. Right now, it is very challenging to identify any, to find any lawyer willing to take your case especially we speak about those who are prosecuted as extremists and other criminal code articles. This is also because, according to Belarusian laws, a personal lawyer uh, uh, can uh, be in a uh, trial and in in pre-trial investigation so this is a brief answer to your question okay thank you is there another question denise yes second question is is there a logic behind holding a political prisoner incommunicado what does the lukashenko regime gain from doing this they are already holding the person captive and they can strictly control what they communicate with the outside world. Well, uh, again, uh, that sounds like a, a question for Paolo being the lawyer here. Okay. I will start answering this question. You know, these uh, atrocity approaches uh, to political prisoners uh, are very, are very difficult uh, to justify or explain by any human nature. It's actually impossible to say why they apply additional pressure means to political prisoners. However, you might guess that uh, the authorities have nothing uh, have nothing to to take care of. I mean, they see no limits to hurting a political prisoner and uh, his or her family even worse, to make their life even worse than it was prior to that. So their logic is the logic of the people who who are dishonest people. I do not remember the proper word in Belarusian. Okay. Next question. Denise, is there another question? Yes. Uh, a broader question this time. Um, how has the war in Ukraine impacted political imprisonment in Belarus and the human rights crisis there in general? Well, then I'm going to go to Anastasia uh, with that one. Thank you. But I think Alech also wanted to add something. And Alech, of course. Yeah. 
You want to start, Anastasia, and then we can switch to Alec? I think Alec wanted to add something on the previous question. On the so previous question. Okay, go ahead, Alec, please. Indeed, I have an add-on. In my view, uh, this uh, ill treatment of uh, prisoners who are prison inmates, this is a very pragmatic step of the Belarusian regime because that's the way to scare all other people who are not in prisons. So this is not revenge. This is not emotional revenge. No, this is very pragmatic. When I was, uh, when I was in prison, we could uh, see that the, the, the authorities would grab and arrest and uh, sentence uh, famous people, you know, like uh, famous professors, uh, artists, uh, directors, uh, editors, uh, chief editors, and others. Why? Because they want this to be known. If you detain an elderly person, who knows the person? Just his or her colleagues, some family members, and that's it. But if you uh, detain a famous person, and then this is what helps you to threaten the entire society. So this is a purposeful action. That's why they ensure ill treatment in prisons in order for the person to be afraid. So people are afraid not to get to prison, not to go into streets, not to like things in social media, not to say a word. So this goes on top of what Pavel has said. I fully agree with him, but I would add this little comment as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, well, let's go back to the question of how the uh, full-scale invasion of Russia in Ukraine has uh, had an influence on what's going on with the prisoner situation in Belarus. Over to you, Anastasia. Thank you. Yes, well, one immediate uh, thing is that uh, Belarusian authorities are also prosecuting those who support Ukraine in this war those who express any kind of support or who share the location or the movement of Russian troops uh, on the territory of Belarus. As you know, Belarus provides its infrastructure and territory to the Russian troops for the full-scale invasion. So um, that's one immediate thing. Another thing is obviously with the horrible atrocities happening with regards to, in connection to the war, the full-scale invasion. Um, the international attention for objective reasons sort of shifts away from Belarus to the war. And uh, to some extent, it might send the wrong message to the authorities that they can now continue doing the things inside the country without the proper uh, attention of the international community, which is, you know, if we continue raising the issue of political prisoners, then it's just going to be sending the obvious signal that that's not the case and we still are keeping an eye on everything that is happening inside the country. And also, I guess, um, before the full-scale invasion, there was more hope to directly um, influence Belarusian authorities. Now there is sort of this feeling that Belarus and Russia are very close tied together and um, without influencing the Russian authorities, without... Uh, a big change happening there, it might be difficult to achieve a big change in Belarus. These are the things that I could think of. Uh, I think Pavel had his hand up. Sorry for uh, moderating a bit. Yeah, go. No, absolutely. Please go ahead. Yes. I also have a comment about that, and I would like to give you a few figures. A few days ago, we at Vesna estimated estimated the uh, prosecution cases, the number of cases uh, of people who were prosecuted for anti-war protests. And uh, as of today, uh, we can estimate, this is not uh, comprehensive data, but this is what we know. There are certain people uh, um, who were sentenced for um, sabotage, who who tried to slow down the 
movement, uh, railroad movement of uh, Russian uh, uh, military, and these uh, people in total got uh, 200 years of prison in total, 15 people, uh, 13 people. Um, uh, there were people who shared photos of Russian troops in Belarus, so at least 35 people were sentenced for that. Uh, people who expressed their willingness to fight on the side of Ukraine and the war either in Belarusian or Ukrainian platoons, uh, at least uh, 13 people sentenced for that, for expressing their willingness. And at least 26 people were sentenced uh, for, uh, for, uh, for participating in fundraising uh, of uh, Belarusian uh, platoons in Ukraine for uh, protesting against uh, uh, Russian actions uh, in uh, Ukraine. So at least uh, uh, 70 people were sentenced to prison terms of, of 1 to 23 years. Okay. Uh, we're nearly at the top of the hour. I don't know if we have time for one more question. Denise, what do you think? Yes, we have one last question for Ale, and it says, how can we support former political prisoners like yourself who have recently been released by the Belarusian authorities? What kinds of support are helpful for those who remain in Belarus and also for those who leave Belarus? Speaking of those who left Belarus, need assistance to integrate in the societies where they are now. It depends on the age of the person, on the skills and qualifications of the person. Speaking of myself, yes, I'm an adult. I'm, all, I'm almost of a, a pension age. One person is supposed to retire and this person is forced to, to change his or her entire life, this person requires assistance of multiple institutions, including um, human rights NGOs and international organizations. I know a couple of journalists, including one of my friends, who is in Lithuania, just like me, and he is jobless, and it is really hard for him. Uh, there's hardly any chance for him to get any job Younger people who are more physically capable and who can retrain and re-educate, uh, it is easier for them to get a new employment. And uh, what they need is uh, mental support. They have to be given a chance to get uh, other education skills, uh, a new job. And also it's important for people to to stay close to 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 their friends and family this helps us when we are uh, in asylum and those people who were released from prisons and who stay in Belarus their fate is very doomed because uh, they can be taken into prisons again i know one person who stayed in belarus and who tried to be socially active in his community I'm not even giving you the name of this community, but uh, this person has started uh, uh, getting additional punishments. Uh, he was taken to prison again for several days. So these people will be hunted for by the authorities after they are released from prisons. Authorities continue to scrutinize them. At least earlier, we could see that these people were isolated. They were they were simply detained by police on the eve of various public holidays. Let's say in Minsk city, when there was a European championship on ice hockey, at that time, all political activists who were identified by, who had been identified by authorities, the majority of them were detained and taken to the Krestina uh, uh, pre-trial uh, pre detention center. 
So I would advise those people to to flee from the country and their institutions helping Belarusians to flee from Belarus. So that's my advice to those people. Thank you, Alech. Well, and on that, I think we're going to uh, conclude our event today. Again, I'd like to thank our distinguished panel, Alech Ruzdjelovic, uh, Anastasia Kruope, and Pavel Sapelko. I'd also like to thank all of you uh, who took the time to listen in uh, today and ask questions, uh, as was mentioned in the context of the ongoing war in, in Ukraine, and now, of course, the events that are happening in the Middle East. It's really uh, important uh, to keep uh, the situation uh, in Belarus uh, uppermost uh, on people's radars uh, so that it doesn't recede into the background. Uh, so we thank our guests for reminding us of that and thank all of you for joining us. And uh, remember that if you want to follow uh, what's going on, RFERL is the place to do it. Thank you.